We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So I encourage you, please, to open your Bibles. And yes, take a Bible from those tables. Use it, because when you have a sermon, you, you should be looking in the Bible. You know, that's where the sermon comes from, right? So, um, yeah, turn to Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 12. I'll give you a chance to turn to that, and then we're going to move into prayer. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we need you. We love you. We want to honor you and exalt you. We celebrate that, yes, no power of hell, no scheme of man can pluck us from your hand because we are yours. We love you and we want to serve you. We want to live for you. And now as we come to your word, we want to learn from you. We want your word to be planted deeply within our hearts so that it brings new life and change and growth in us. We want that to happen, but we can't make it happen. So Lord, we need you. Please, Holy Spirit, would you come and move in this room and move among those who are watching online? Would you come and move? Move in your power, in your way, as you decide. Would you empower me as I speak so that the words I speak may be more than just human, that, they, that you may take them and use them for your purposes. We pray that you will move in all of our hearts, that you will work in our hearts, that you will transform us, that you will take the seed of the gospel that we hear this morning and that you will plant it deeply there and that you will water it and make it grow roots and make it grow and bear fruit and do your thing, Lord. Do your work in our hearts and our lives. And may you bring all glory and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. This is the third sermon in a series of sermons, each of them looking at the first half of Romans chapter 8. Uh, This chapter really is talking about our identity in Christ. Um, You, yeah, the title of the sermon is Killing Sin, and you'll see why in a moment. Basically, Romans 8, up until this point, has said that you used to be totally trapped under the power of sin, unable to free yourself. However, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the perfect Savior, has set you free. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be Free indeed. Yeah, okay. So you are set free. All right? There is no condemnation for you. You know, back years ago, there was a show called Seinfeld. Remember there was the soup Nazi? No soup for you! Well, that guy was crazy. God is not. But God says, because of Jesus, no condemnation for you. All right? Jesus has set you free. And therefore, Jesus now enables you to live in the freedom and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Romans 8 has said up to this point. Okay? So today we're going to look at, okay, those things are true. What does that mean? How do we practically, day-to-day lives, how do we apply it today, each of us? All right? This is the applicable stuff. This is the how stuff, the how-to. Okay? How does that work? We're going to get to that this morning. (laughs) Uh, About five years ago, my daughter's now 10. When she was five, she asked my wife, she said, Mommy, how do, ag- how do adults get born? And my wife said, well, they all start off as babies. <laughs> she wasn't buying it. Okay, so now we say, uh, St. Paul, who, who wrote Romans, how do saints get made? And he says, they all start out as spiritual babies. The question is, are you buying it? Can you, you and me, can we, spiritual babies or spiritual non-black belts, let's call it, <laughs> Can we really mature and grow and change? He says, yeah, we all start out this way. But, there, but growth and change is possible. The question is, are we buying it? I hope so. Okay, so this morning we're going to look at one. There are, not, there are many important aspects. This morning we're going to look at one important aspect of how we change and grow as Christians. Okay? We're going to be looking specifically about how we fight sin, how we fight against sin and get it out of our lives. 
or out. How do you say that as Canadians, right? Okay, so Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of God. Okay, verse 12. Paul says, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Our obligation is basically to kill sin, as you'll see. He says, therefore, because whenever you see a therefore in the text, you've got to wonder what the therefore is there for, right? Okay, so what is it there for? Well, it's there because we are under no condemnation, because we are set free from sin, because we are led by the Holy Spirit. Because these things are true, we now have a role to play. We now have an obligation. As Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we are now slaves to righteousness, which is a whole lot better than being a slave to sin. Okay, so what's an obligation? Um, it's an act uh, or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. It's a duty. Okay. Because of Jesus, we have an obligation to live according to the Spirit rather than according to the flesh. Okay? The calling of a Christian, in, at least in this aspect, is simply to no longer choose to live under the authority, under the power of sin. Instead, to choose to live under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our obligation. That's how it works, at least in this context. Okay? So verse 13. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. Sin kills you. The wages of sin is death and so on. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Okay. In referring to this verse, the great Puritan preacher John Owen said, Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. You are at war. In uh, Lord of the Rings, King Theoden says, I will not risk open war. And Aragorn says, Open war is upon you whether you would risk it or not. John Owen says, be killing sin, because if you don't, sin's going to be killing you. You're at war whether you like it or not, if you're a Christian. At war with sin, with sin in your own life. Don't try to fix others. Look, it's your own stuff, right? So this is what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be doing holy ninja training. We often think of ninja as highly skilled, you know, you know great practice and discipline and all that, right? yes. But you know what ninjas were? They were assassins. <laughs> but we're not, we're not doing physical training like that. That's not cool. But we are at war with sin. We are. And so we're going to be doing holy ninja training this morning. All right? One commentator says that Paul reminds his readers that the life-giving power of God's Spirit is finally effective only in those who continue to let the Spirit change their lives. God himself is living in you if you are a follower of Jesus. But the power of God's Spirit is only effective in you if you continue to let the Holy Spirit do his thing. If you choose to live under the power of the Spirit, if you seek to do that, if that's the direction of your heart and life, His power is at work in you and look out. But if you say no thanks and turn to sin, His power is still there. It's just not having an impact. You're turning away. Right? You see the difference? You see why this matters? Right? Okay, so let the Holy Spirit have His way in you. The Bible calls Him the Holy Spirit for a reason because He is holy and his aim is to make us holy. So let me show you what I mean. 
Okay. I was a wreck when I was in seminary. Sin was killing me in many ways, um, but God in his grace sent a really good and gifted uh, counselor, retired counselor, Christian counselor, who walked along me during those years. He did it for free, actually. Um, I often remember telling him that I hated my sin and wishing that it was physical so that I could actually hit it. I had some training in karate, so I knew at least how to deal with a physical opponent, right? But my sin wasn't. It's frustrating. It was crushing me. It was killing me. It was, it was so frustrating. It, it's like the more I tried to fight against my sin, the more it felt like I was fighting against myself and beating myself up. I felt helpless. And so I had a 75-pound big punching bag in the basement, you know, like the big heavy ones that you kind of need gloves on or else you hurt your knuckles. I didn't have gloves. Um, but it, would, it was hanging there in my basement. And sometimes when I was so frustrated with my sin, I would just be pounding on the thing for a while, just trying, imagining in, in sometimes that this punching bag represented my sin. So I was pounding it the hardest that I could. I'd finish all exhausted, sweaty, often with bloody knuckles. And it was just swinging there, taunting me. <laughs> Not getting anywhere. Right? And that's how I felt spiritually speaking. Does that sink in? Does that kind of make sense? And then it got, it didn't get worse. It, it was, that frustration was multiplied because I came to this passage. If by, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It's like, how do I do that? Right? And then Colossians 3 verse 5 is the same thing. Paul says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. I'm like, yes, but how? That, that was basically my three or four years in seminary. It was great. Um, Here's the thing, though. By the, by the Holy Spirit, we can actually put our sin to death. Are we going to be perfect this side of heaven? No. We don't need to. But we can put our sin to death. We can give it a few good uppercuts, and it'll back down real quick. How? How do we do that? By remembering three things and then doing one thing. Okay? So we're going to look at that. First thing we need to remember if we want to put our sin to death, we've got to remember who we are. Verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God, rather than by the sinful nature, are sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Your sinful nature has died. Jesus Christ has set you free. And then you are free indeed. So then why don't we often feel free? Okay, well, I, I know that I'm supposed to be free, but why don't I feel it? Okay, there's a reason. There is a preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones is his name. Um, earlier part of the 20th century he was preaching. Um, Tim Keller, who's one person who I deeply value as a preacher, um, he referred to this illustration that Martin Lloyd-Jones originally used. So I heard it from Tim Keller. All right, so you're getting it third hand, I guess. So here it is. Imagine a country in which one group of people has for centuries enslaved another group of people. Right? And therefore, whenever a member of the enslaved group would meet a member of the oppressing group in the streets, the member of the oppressing group could tell this enslaved person what to do. And if this person didn't do it, this guy would have him beaten or killed. It's a real problem. Right? But then a good king came to power, and he decreed emancipation for all slaves. And he set up his soldiers and policemen in every town and all that, so it was all captured on video, you could say. I'm not sure Martin Lloyd-Jones would have said that, but it was policed. This kingdom was now policed, and the oppressing group could no longer legally oppress the other group, nor did they have the power to do so, right? Do you think that's all it takes in order for the oppressed group to finally start to live free? No, there's more than that, because... In our imagination. The reality is that when a member of the enslaved group would encounter a member of the oppressing group in the street, the member of the enslaved group would be shaking with fear. Now, there's nothing that the member of the oppressing group could have done, could have done anymore. They had no more power, no more right to do anything. 
But these people, whenever they saw them, would be terrified. They'd still, they were still thinking that they were oppressed. So over and over again, the members of the enslaved group continued to act like slaves because although their status had truly and actually changed, they hadn't personally grasped it. They hadn't understood it. They didn't know how to live according to it. They knew it was correct on paper, but they didn't know what it meant in their own hearts and lives. Yeah? Okay. So that's the story. After telling the story, Tim Keller says this, word for word. Every Christian in this room is in that condition. It's the only reason you do anything wrong that you cannot change, that you are still all wrapped up and absorbed in bondage and addictions. In other words, your only problem is that you don't know who you are, who you are. It takes time for that new reality to sink in. And therefore, whenever we find ourselves returning to sins and addictions, feeling crushed by their weight, by their power, what we need more than anything else is to remember who we are. I am in Jesus Christ. I am free in Jesus. Jesus has set us free. Sin does not have the ability to boss us around. We were under the power of sin, and we were slaves to sin, actually. But now in Christ, we are not. Sin used to be able to tell us what to do. Now sin is helpless. But it likes to lie. Okay? So that's the first thing. We need to remember who we are. Second. Come on, baby. We need to remember whose we are. We need to remember who we are. We need to remember whose we are. Verse 15. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So in other words, we need to remember that we belong to our heavenly Father, and he's good. But here, we got to get to that. In the Heidelberg Catechism, now the Heidelberg, if you're not familiar with the Christian Reformed Church, um, the Heidelberg Catechism is kind of like our study guide that we use, our study guide to the Bible we use in our denomination. Um, it's composed of a number of questions and answers. It starts, the very first one is this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Answer, that I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. Right? Okay. In our battle against sin, so much really comes down to our view of God. Yes, we believe that God is our Father. But deep down, really, in our heart of hearts, what kind of Father do we think He is? For many years, in my heart of hearts, I used to believe that my Heavenly Father was the cosmic killjoy. I didn't really believe that he loved me. It wasn't a reality in my heart. See, I'm always saying, we know the theology. The question is, what does our heart believe, right? Does it filter down? I didn't believe in my heart of hearts that he loved me. And therefore, when he called me to obedience, to repentance, to surrender... It felt like a losing proposition. It felt like it wasn't worth it. I resented the fact that God called me to turn from sin, because frankly, I enjoyed sin. I didn't enjoy Him. I did not trust that God had my best interests at heart. So the question is this Does God truly have our best interests at heart or not? That's the question we all face every time that we're tempted. Every time we're tempted, we're, we're faced ultimately with that question. Does my Heavenly Father who gave me this command, this call, this whatever it is, does He really have my best interests at heart? If He does, then it, it's a no-brainer. Yes, I want to do this. If He's malicious, then there's not a chance I want to do this. So... God says, do not steal, <laughs> and be generous. And yet in our heart of hearts, 
when we give in to sin, to steal, we think actually in our, uh, I think life actually would be better if we stole, at least just this time, just once. Or we know that God calls us to be sexually pure and holy, and yet we think somehow in our heart of hearts that life would be better if we did whatever, looked at porn or had an affair or whatever, right? In our heart of hearts, that's what we believe, and so that's why we act that way. That's why we give in to temptation in that circumstance. Perhaps in other circumstances, we, say we, re we recognize the lie for what it is, the temptation as a lie, but when we give in, it's because we believe in our heart of hearts in that moment that our Heavenly Father does not have good intentions for us. So now I ask, though, what kind of father is our Heavenly Father really? Is he a manipulative, selfish, scheming scoundrel? Is he a malicious tyrant who only wants to ruin our lives and steal our fun? If we ask him for a fish, is he going to give us a snake? If we ask him for an egg, will he give us a scorpion? Read Luke chapter 11. Not now. Is he a malicious God or is he the very definition of love who completely gave himself for us in order to save us? Scripture says it pretty clear. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Lavished on us, not stingy. 1 John chapter 4, same book, a little, little bit later. Dear brothers and sisters, let us love one another. Why? For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because why? God is love. Furthermore, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus on the cross. How do you know your heavenly father loves you? Jesus. Slam dunk, case closed. There's no further discussion needed because that's the ultimate expression of the father's heart toward his children. He would rather die than have them be without him. There's that song by Chris Tomlin, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, and that's who I am. Okay, so that's the second thing to remember. First, we remember who we are. Second, we need to remember whose we are, that we have a good, good father. Third, we need to remember whose resources we have. Verse 17, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share with his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul's writing to people who are suffering for their faith. So, yeah, if you're walking with Jesus, you're, you're going to suffer. <laughs> right? Okay. We are heirs with God, co-heirs with Christ. Is God wealthy? Yeah, he made it. Yeah, he's wealthy. Ephesians 1, same thing. Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you hear that? Every single blessing? You lack nothing in Jesus. Whatever difficulty you and I are facing in our walk with God, it's not because God isn't helping us. <laughs> we have everything that we need. The issue is that we need to learn to access or learn to deploy or learn to use those resources. 1 Peter 1, similar kind of thing. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into, in, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance, heirs, inheritance, that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power. In Jesus, you have an inheritance, and you don't have to wait for somehow someone to die again in order to get it. He's already died. The inheritance is already yours now. 
In other words, you have all the resources of heaven itself at your disposal as a child of God. Okay? So if you ever struggle with sin or struggle or stagger under temptation, it's not because you lack anything. Rather, you are an heir of the kingdom of God. You simply need to access and deploy your resources. Got it? Okay. Summary so far. On the one hand, if you and I ever fail to change as we should and as we want to, it's because we are not remembering the gospel. Okay, preach the gospel to yourself every day. So important. You need to remember who you are in Christ. You are set free in Christ. Second, you need to remember whose you are, that you belong to a good, good father who only has good things for you. And you need to remember the resources that you have because you belong to this good, good father. Your father's limitless resources are at your disposal. And now, the last thing, you need to put it into action. Doing one thing. So we need to remember three things and do one thing. Here's the do one thing. Here's the last piece. And that is, we need to actively engage by the Holy Spirit. Engage in battle. We're in battle. Remember, we're holy ninja trainer trainees right now. Battle. We're going to actively engage in battle by the Spirit. How does that work? How, what is our role in killing sin? I think the key to figuring this out is Romans 8, verse 13. Look it up in your Bible. It's there again. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Okay. By the Spirit. By the Spirit. Okay. Ephesians 6, verse 17. You don't have to look it up if you don't want, although you can. It's this. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. He's talking about spiritual warfare. It's the Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare chapter, right? Hey. Okay. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Huh. I got this insight from John Piper. I really appreciate him, too. The Word of God, the Bible, is your weapon for killing sin in your life. Whenever you are tempted to sin, you need to counterattack with the Word of God. That's what Jesus did in the desert when he was tempted by Satan. Three times. Remember, Satan tried to tempt Jesus by twisting Scripture, and each time Jesus responded with Scripture, and Satan's temptations bounced off. Okay, so therefore, I want to suggest a pattern for killing sin in your life. Are there more patterns? Are there other ways to look at it? Sure. But I, I just su suggest this this morning. You actually can find this uh, paper in your bulletin if it's helpful. Um, so we're just going to spend the last bit looking at this, okay? So I want to suggest this pattern for killing sin in your life. First, recognize the temptation for what it is, and that is that it's a lie. It's a lie. Your life will be better if... If you give in to this, right? And then recognizing that lie, you counter the lie with what? With the truth. For, find scripture where the promises of God outweigh the promises of sin. You cannot just make a drive or a desire in your life go away. That doesn't work that way. We aren't designed to work that way. Instead, you counter one drive with a stronger drive, with a stronger desire. If I'm really hungry, I want to eat. But if when I'm really hungry and want to eat, I hear my kid crying out in pain because he just hurt himself, that's a stronger drive, and I temporarily forget about the hunger, and I'm like, okay, what happened, buddy? Right? Certain, it, when a stronger drive steps in, it makes the other one disappear, at least in that moment, right? Okay. So you've got to find scripture where the promises of God outgive the benefits that the specific sin or temptation would offer. And then third, you need to memorize and internalize those promises. And then fourth, you need to ask God for help. You need to trust God in the struggle by clinging to those promises. We're not going into it this morning. I'll just say this. Through my experience at Dunamis, learning about the Holy Spirit who empowers us for ministry... My personal relationship with not just the Father and the Son, but with the Holy Spirit has really grown. And I've learned in the context of temptation, I can just say, Holy Spirit, I don't want this. Please help. 
There's an active personal conversation that happens. That's really helpful. <laughs> That's another topic. But really, step number four is ask God for help and then trust him in the struggle, clinging on to God's promises. So let's look briefly at a few examples, all right? Um, stealing, I mentioned that before. We're going to break down uh, our response to the temptation towards stealing, okay, as one example. We'll, we'll hit a couple others as well. Stealing. So recognize the tempter's lie when it comes. The lie is something like this. It usually comes in the first person. My life will be better if I have more money and more stuff, if I get this thing, whatever, right? My life will be better if I have more stuff. So then you counter that with the truth of Scripture. One passage is Jesus says, Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. God gives far more than whatever that little tiddlywink that you wanted. <laughs> right? So then you've got to internalize those promises. Yes, memorize the scripture, but then say, okay, what does that mean specifically to me? Perhaps one way to say it is this. And you need to take it yourself so that it becomes your own motto in your heart. Right? Um, Perhaps God is a greater treasure than anything this world could offer. That would work, right? And then you ask God for help in the struggle and trust him. God, I choose to trust you for my material well-being. Help me to be honest about this. Help me to live with integrity, whatever, right? And then you're actively engaging with the Holy Spirit to live in obedience there. Okay, that's one example Another example, uh, lust. I mentioned that earlier. Recognize the tempter's lie when it comes. My life will be better or I will be happier if I have more temporary pleasure from porn or premarital sex, sleeping with my boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Um, that's the lie. It says your life will be better if you do that. Counter that lie with Scripture. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. There's so many more passages that speak to this. That's a big deal. Get to draw near to God? Yeah, okay. So then internalize God's promises. The joy of knowing God, the joy of seeing his face is going to make whatever I'm offered here, it's, it's, it's not even important. Who cares? The joy of knowing the Lord deeply is so much more important to me. So then you ask him and trust him for help. God, you are the greatest pleasure. You are the greatest joy that there is. You are where I find my meaning, and I want to know you deeper all the time. And so please, Lord, I choose to keep sexual pleasure in its proper place, and I ask you to fill my life with everything I need, you know, and so on, right? Last one. Those two are pretty straightforward, stealing and, and lust. Those are pretty clearly observable sins or, or certainly easy to understand, Let's do one now, last one, a little bit more nuanced, okay? Self-pity. Is it wrong to feel sad for your... Like, is it... When you're suffering, is it wrong to feel your pain? No. If you're suffering, pay attention, right? God gave us feelings for a reason. But self-pity is where you go, ouch, I'm hurting, to everyone needs to notice, right? Okay. Self-pity. Recognize the tempter's lie when it comes... I will feel more valued and more vindicated if everyone sees how much I'm suffering. If I draw everyone's attention to my suffering. It's a form of pride, by the way. Okay. So you counter that with the truth of Scripture. Because what you're looking for there is you want to be significant. Or some, something along that line, right? Okay, so you counter that with the truth of Scripture. The lie is I want to be more significant, so I'm going to draw everyone's attention to my suffering. Scripture says, Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you or calm you like a baby. Calm you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Huh. That's a bigger gift than having a few people be aware that you're having a bad day. <laughs> right? So then you ask God for help and then you trust him in the battle. God, I know I'm feeling down right now and there's real pain, but I choose, I choose to believe in the fact that you love me, that you are for me, that I belong to you, that I matter to you, and that you are with me. And so, Lord, please, in this context, help me to whatever I need to do, right? 
Okay. So I suggest this pattern for battling sin in your life. Obviously, it's not going to be a one and done thing. And there are other ways you can look at it too. The idea here is that you go from, okay, I shouldn't do bad things, to getting to the heart of it, which is where the motivations lie. Asking God to work in your heart to transform things from the inside out, right? What we're doing with this pattern is applying the promises of God specifically to the point where we need them to, to be applied. Okay. Lastly, and very briefly, I also just want to mention, this is going to require support. Accountability, genuine relationships, authenticity in relationships. Having one or two friends, or sometimes more, but usually one or two is all it needs. One or two friends with, with whom you can be honest, raw honest, is so helpful. I can't tell you how much that's been a help, help to me. James 5 verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. This is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So brothers and sisters, we need to be killing sin or sin will be killing us. If we engage in this battle though, pay attention to this because we are going to find God himself fighting alongside us and that means we win. <laughs> right? The warrior of heaven and earth, he lifts his voice and the earth melts, it says in Psalm 46. The warrior of heaven and earth fighting alongside you, you'll be okay. <laughs> Our role is simply to remember who we are, to remember whose we are, to remember whose resources we have, and then to actively engage in the battle by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it comes down to this in the end. This is true. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can actually and truly kill sin in our lives. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Jesus, all this would be, would be, this would be nothing but a nice self-help talk if you hadn't chosen to give your life for ours at the cross. The whole reason that we have hope, that we can have joy in our suffering, the whole reason that there is healing for the brokenhearted and for the broken is because you, the Lord of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, chose to come down to earth Ultimately, to take our place, to endure the cross for us, and you insisted on doing it and staying there till the end, until it was finished. So Jesus, we cry, please, would you receive honor and glory and power and praise? You are worthy to receive that, and you are worthy to receive all the adoration and the affection of our hearts. Have your way in us, Lord. Renew us. Help us to live for you. Stumbling, sure, tripping often, but help us to live for you nonetheless. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But take my heart, Lord Jesus, and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. We commit ourselves to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.